outlaw schoology every single grade, and that's the story of the evolution of Wade. AB Calculus students, it's time to close chapter 5 for good. This is the last lesson, 5-6, and today we have just a couple little tidbits extra to add to the chapter, just some of the leftovers we never got to discuss. So we start today with an integral from 0 to k. Now these are called the limits of integration, the boundaries, or the window, or the domain on the x-axis, from 0 to an unknown constant k, all right? And this, of course, is called a definite integral, not an indefinite, because you will get a definite answer and you are integrating on definite limits. So, this time, for the first time ever, I'm going to tell you what the integral is actually equal to. We actually know the outcome, sort of, with a k in there, but we've got to figure out what value of k makes this possible. You could be manufacturing something as an engineer and need to figure out what do I make the k value so that this bottle holds a certain amount of Sprite or Coca-Cola or something like that, right, or water. So, let's find k. The integration of 3kx squared, let's integrate that, would be 3kx, add 1 to the power, cubed, divide by the new power, 3 and always divide by the chain rule. But the base is x. It's the only thing being squared. And the chain rule of x is 1, so you are technically dividing by 1. Who cares, right? Minus. OK, common mistake calculus students make. They look at this, and they integrate 5k to be 5k squared over 2. Wait a minute. Why are you adding 1 to the power on the k? You see, the brain does that sometimes x is the variable. That's what you add 1 to the power of. k is a constant. 5 times k is a number. When you integrate a number, isn't it just number x? You remember this? Because the derivative of number x is number. It also happens to be x to the 0, by the way. So it would be x to the first divided by 1 is how you integrate that. All right, so be careful there evaluated from 0 to k, and the outcome should be 4k squared. Or your boss has told you this has to hold 4k squared ounces of liquid or whatever this happens to be. So, of course, cancel the threes. Don't mess around with that. Plug in the top, plug in the bottom. Remember, it's top minus bottom in this chapter. So if we plug in k first, we'll get k times k cubed is k to the fourth minus 5k times k is k squared. There's f of k minus f of 0. If you plug in 0 for all the x's, you actually just get 0 because it's a polynomial. Okay? But sometimes you plug in 0 and you don't get 0, so don't always fall for that. Look at the problem. And the outcome should be 4k squared. All right. I'm going to drop the 0. I'm going to drop the parentheses. We don't need those anymore because there's nothing on it. So uh, k to the fourth minus 5k squared equals 4k squared. All right, now we have to go back and talk about some old strategy. If you had my class for integrated 3, there's something I used to say all the time, and here's where it comes into play. Students are tempted to add the 5k squared over to the other side, and you actually end up losing one of your solutions if you do that. Okay? If any teacher ever told you to do that, do not add this to the other side. All right? That's hogwash. Here's what I used to say back in integrated 3. If there's only one type of exponent on your unknown, then yes, you can just try to isolate and get k by itself. If these were all k squareds, that would be one type of exponent. You could just gather them on one side of the equation. But if you see two or more different types of powers, on your x or k or whatever you're trying to solve for. Two or more different types of powers, the only mathematical way to solve it is to get it equal to zero, okay? That's that old thing I used to say. I'm going to say it again in calculus. We have fourth powers. We also have k squareds. That's two different kinds of powers. You must get the problem equal to zero or you will never be able to fully solve it. So you actually end up subtracting the 4k squared over to here, okay? Don't ever add 5k squared in that case. A lot of students do, and they lose some of their answers. I'm just telling you. 
So k to the fourth minus 9k squared. That's better. So it's all about equation solving strategies, isn't it, right? Especially in this class. Algebraic strategies and being efficient at all times and being correct. So let's go back to equation solving 101. From my integrated three class, when you solve an equation, step number one, you get it equal to zero. Step number two, if you see it, you factor out the greatest common factor, which in this case would be k squared. That's why, well, one of the many reasons you learned factoring back in the old days, and that's x squared minus 9. Hey, that's called the difference of two squares right there. That factors into k plus 3 and k minus 3. Or you don't even really have to do that if you can see the roots, the solutions, the x-intercepts. When does k squared equal 0? When k equals 0. When does k squared minus 9 equal 0? And how do you do it without factoring it? It's plus or minus 3, isn't it? Right? You see it? We've done that one many times. All right? And so you get three answers, 0, positive 3, negative 3. Now, one more thing before you put down your final answer. There was a stipulation at the very beginning. Under the parameter, k is greater than 0. All right? Those are your parameters, your domain, if you will. k greater than 0 are the only valid answers especially if this is like a real life water bottle, it can't have negative something, you know, negative length, negative height, negative depth. So k is greater than zero. Okay, zero is not greater than itself. So zero's out. Uh, negative three is not greater than zero. Only positive three is the real answer. All right, so you get most of the points. If you get to here, you did great. Check out the parameters and make sure you put the valid answer. That can happen sometimes. All right, k equals 3, done. Okay, letter B, another definite integral from pi to k of sine of 3x dx. And I'm going to give you what it equals. It equals negative 1 third, all right? So the integration of sine, okay, remember this. The derivative of sine is cosine. So the integration of sine is negative cosine. You remember that? Backwards world, right? Opposite world. Okay, and that gets confused all the time, I know, because you're all kind of brand new to integration and you're still thinking derivatives, but the integration of sine is negative cosine of 3x. And I know that can be confusing sometimes because your brain is still on derivatives. The derivative of sine was cosine, Mr. Wade. Oh, it's backwards world now, right. All right, so negative cosine of 3x, every integration gets divided by the chain rule, which in this case would be 3. Evaluated from pi to k equals negative one third. All right, now, optional step we have never done before. Normally, if we're integrating, you just you you leave the three there. I mean, where could you where else could you put it? You can't move it anywhere else, right? You're stuck with it. You're also stuck with a negative. Isn't that actually negative one third right there? You see that? Okay, so normally you can't do anything with it, you just leave it there. However, Today, we actually know what the integral is equal to. We have another side of the equation. We have a left side and a right side instead of you just integrating and plugging in numbers. So I have a piece of advice. If you have two sides of the story starting today, you're allowed to do things to both sides, right? So how about this? If you wanna make this a little easier, you don't have to do this, but to make it easier, Let's get rid of negative one-third by multiplying both sides by its reciprocal, negative three over one. Remember the reciprocal trick? And if I do it on the left, I do it on the right. Now, only because we knew what it was equal to today did we have both sides of the story. That's when you can do things to both sides. So you can take advantage of this moment. It won't happen in the rest of the chapter, but it happens in this last section. So these will crisscross, right? Cancel out the fraction with its own reciprocal. Now you're working with something that's not a fraction and also not negative and it's just a little bit easier. Okay? Matter of fact, I think it's a lot easier. Over here, negative times negative is a positive and these just happen to be 3 and 3 that are going to cross cancel so you actually end up getting positive 1 over here. Okay? They won't always be reciprocals over here but they will be over here because you chose it yourself. Alright, so now it's easier. No thirds, no negatives. Now plug in your top minus bottom. Cosine of 3k minus cosine of 3 pi equals 1. There we go. All right. 
Thou shalt know thy graphs. It's so important. You must know your graphs, okay? I need to know the graph of cosine from pre-calculus to do the cosine of 3 pi. So what's the cosine of 3 pi, all right? Remember, the cosine graph is not the one that hits the origin. That's sine, okay? We'll kind of draw a few peaks here. So cosine of 0 is a peak. Cosine of pi is a valley. Cosine of 2 pi is a peak. Cosine of 3 pi is a valley. The cosine of any odd pi is a valley. And all valleys are worth negative 1, aren't they? All peaks are worth positive 1. So you do have to have the cosine graph committed to memory in this class because we're going to use it so often, all right? So cosine of odd pi, valley. Valley worth negative 1, okay? Now you get minus minus 1. Let's change that into a plus 1. Let's go over here. Cosine of 3k plus 1 equals 1. All right, now here we go. Let's see if we can figure out how to solve the rest of this equation because we don't know what 3k is, so we can't take the cosine of what we don't know. Subtract 1 from both sides. Cosine of 3k equals 0. You're one step closer. Okay, and now it's time for a new game. You could have played this in pre-calculus. I don't know if you did because you didn't have me for pre-calculus, but I can tell you how to play this game from pre-calculus. You cover up the 3k, all right? Let's cover that up. And you ask yourself, cosine of my hand equals zero. Cosine of what equals zero? Well, let's set the 3k over here on the shelf because it doesn't really matter yet. I'm gonna put that off to the side. What could I replace 3k with so that this is a true sentence? Cosine of whatever you are is zero. Again, you need the cosine graph, okay? But this time we're not looking at three pi. We're looking for whose cosine equals zero, all right? How about this crossing right here? That's where cosine equals zero. You know where that is? Pi over two, a half pi. If I put pi over two in place of my hand or in place of 3k, cosine of pi over two is zero. True sentence, right? But there are more. But wait, there's more. How about the next crossing? The next crossing is between 1 pi and 2 pi's. Isn't that 1 and a half or what we call 3 over 2 pi? There's another place I could swap in for 3k and make it a true sentence. Cosine of 3 pi over 2 equals 0. True. You know what the next one is? 5 pi over 2. My 5's look like S's. 5 pi over 2 cosine is 0. So you have to know your cosine graph, otherwise you can't do this. All right, hey, guess what? Dot, dot, dot goes to infinity. The cosine graph goes forever. It has infinite x-intercepts, all right? Every single half pi is going to be a valid answer there. Now, one last thing, though. What do you have? You've got 3k. What are we trying to solve for? Just k. Well, you have arrived. How do you get rid of 3? Divide both sides by 3, but I don't want to put a fraction over a fraction. What's the same thing as dividing by 3? How about multiplying by one-third? Multiply both sides by one-third, that would be better. So everybody gets a one-third through here. Let's get a close-up. So everybody's got a one-third now. Now why did we do that? Because here, it's going to cancel. So you just get k by itself. Here, any cross-cancellation? No. So it's just going to be pi over 6. Here, oh, threes cross-cancel on this one pi over 2. All right, 5 pi over 6, no cross cancellation there. Dot, 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 this goes forever and ever, and it actually goes in the negative direction too, technically, because there are infinite negative x-intercepts as well. So, basically when you do these sine and cosine problems and even tangent, you get an infinite string of answers, but then they're going to block it off somewhere. I blocked this one off from 0 to pi over 2. Okay, that gives us another story. So, pi over 6 is between 0 and pi over 2. That's a keeper, all right? Think of it like this. What's a half pi? A half pi is actually 3 sixths, if you, if you want to change it. Isn't half 3 sixths? So you can't go past 3 over 6. So 1 sixth is okay. 
5 sixths is higher than 3 sixths, isn't it? Too far. Pi over 2 is right at the edge. Do I keep it or do I toss it? Underlined, keep it. Not underlined, toss it. Including. So you get two valid answers. All right? And that's how you do a sine or cosine integration by knowing the graph. Twice. Cosine of 3 pi, we had to use this. And then you had to look at this for all your solutions over here. Okay? And then letter C, I hope you look at this integration and I hope you recognize it from a previous derivative that we did several chapters ago, all right? There was a derivative we did called arc sine. Remember arc sine of x? And when you take the derivative of arc sine, you get one over the square root of one subtract the base squared times chain rule one. That's arc sine right there, okay? So when you see a number minus x squared under a square root with a subtract, you're going to think arc sine. It's the one with all the s's, okay? Here's the backwards formula. By the way, huge moment right here. I have taught you eight of the nine major things we integrate in calculus. This is the ninth one. I will have now taught you all the nine most common integrals that you're supposed to know. This wraps up that. Now we just keep applying them, all right? So when you see this, the integral of 1 over square root of, I'm going to call this a squared minus u squared du. You kind of write all your formulas, I prefer, with u, all right? Because remember u substitution? You're trying to make them look like these formulas right here. And if you don't need u substitution, great. Like earlier, we just integrated a sine of 3x in the last problem. We didn't use u equals 3x, even though you could have. We took the shortcut and divided by the chain, all right? So if you can conform any problem to look like this, then the integration is arc sine of u over a plus c. That is your ninth and final formula. And yes, I put it on your 10 things I learned about calculus sheet that sums up this whole chapter, all right? So amongst the, the 10 things sheets, you should be able to see all nine integration formulas in there that I want you to know that are really important because we'll use them a lot. So does this look like that? You betcha it does. It's kind of like the arctangent one last time, right? Similar. A squared or number squared is the 256. Well, Reason number five billion, or whatever I said last time, why you should know your perfect squares. Because you have to look at that and just think, oh, that's the biggest one Mr. Wade wants me to know. That's 16 times 16. So you must identify that A is 16 right off the bat. And of course, you know I'm going to give you a nice perfect square. All right. U squared looks like X squared. U and X are variables in calculus. So u must just be plain old x, right? See that there? u is x. And then, of course, remember du must appear in the problem. Well, it does. du is the derivative of x, which is 1, with a dx on the side. Do we have 1 dx? Yes, we do, right there. Notice in the formula it's written on the side, because I think that's better, actually. Some books will put it on top. I think it's better on the side. Well, up here, you've got dx. I would shove that off to the side, and I would just put a 1 upstairs, okay? I find that my, my high school students, at least, they look at it, and they see it way better when they look at it like that than when the dx is up there. It just throws them off sometimes, so that's a better way to look at it. Okay, so a is 16, u is x, du is in the problem. You just had to make sure that it was in there, okay? And then you don't really do u substitution like the arctangent problem. You just go straight to this formula right here. So the final answer is arc sine of u over a, which is really just x over 16. And then, of course, you have to put plus c every time you do an indefinite integral. And that is how you get arc sine. It's very simple. Just know it. Just know the formula. Very simple. I do want to mention one thing because students will get this confused. If you notice last time, when we did arctangent, the arctangent had a 1 over a in front of it. 
And if we get to do a calculus club, I can actually show you in the calculus club why the arc tangent has the 1 over A and the arc sine needs no comp uh, compensation at all. I almost said competition. Compensation. You don't have to compensate with the 1 over A in front. All right. So 1 over A does go with the arc tangent formula. You don't need a coefficient with the arc sine formula. That's a major difference right there, so be careful. Don't accidentally put it or forget it over here. That's it. That does it for Chapter 5. Quick lesson. All right, so now you've got a sample test to do, and we've got some problems to discuss in class. Enjoy. Hold it now. Now, this is the old, this is the test. So people think often, people think, people think. And I know that can be confusing sometimes. And I know that gets confusing sometimes. Now for problem C, we have, <laughs> for crying out loud, that's a minus, not a plus. You idiot. It's a BC problem now. Dog got it. I pledge allegiance to the list of the nine most common things I need to know how to integrate off the top of my head. And to the unusual integrand, which I may encounter, one fraction, under radical, divisible, with integration and differentiation for all.